senior writer, Corey S. Clark, who joins us here via Skype. Corey, how's it going? Uh, it's going all right, Gene. Not great. I don't think any of us are doing great, yeah. but I'm, I'm getting by. We're all getting by. Doing our, doing our best to get through this yeah. uh, tough time. And so we, uh, I asked some people after we did the 91 Michigan game on the boards, and pretty overwhelmingly the game they wanted us to talk about was, not surprisingly, 1994 Choke and Doke. And that's always, it's a warm heart in a lot of our memories. I know I was there. I assume you were, were you at the game with your dad? Uh, I was at the game with my dad. Indeed, I was. Yeah. Awesome. So in a little bit, we're going to be joined by the one person who probably has the best perspective to talk about that. And that is Danny Cannell, of course, the quarterback that led Florida State to that incredible fourth quarter comeback against the Gators back in 1994. But before we get to Danny, first, you and I want to talk a little about kind of lay the lay the groundwork for this game coming in, of course, Florida State coming off the national championship in 1993. Uh, still ranked top five preseason coming into this game. It lost earlier this season to Miami. A really good Miami team down in uh, South Florida that year. What was kind of your memories of Florida State, you know, kind of at this point going into late in the season in 1994? Uh, you know, I remember they had a uh, what I thought and what was actually a, a very good defense. Um, I wasn't honestly uh, – I don't know if I was sold on Cannell. I think this was kind of, and I don't think I was alone in the fan base. Um, I think a lot of the fans were kind of wondering maybe if Thad Busby would get a shot, if it's Thad Busby's turn to play. He was the hot shot. I think he was a, he would have been a freshman then, or a, I think he would have been a freshman. Um, because Cannell just had some moments where he wasn't great. And then, you know, the Miami game in particular, remember he was uh, replaced by uh, Stark. Uh, was it John Stark? I thought it was, was it Stork or Stark? Stork, yeah. Was, might, maybe I'm getting confused with Ron Stark. Yeah, John Stork um, was the backup, and, and Danny didn't play well in the Miami game. I mean, that was a really serious defense. And yeah. um, and so he got replaced in that game, and that didn't go any better for Stork either. Um, or Stark, whatever we're going to call him. And um, and so I remember, obviously, work done was great. Rock Preston was really good. And then after that, you didn't know what you had on offense. Um you still, then, you still had Kez. Kez was a solid receiver. Yeah, yeah. So you, Kez was the guy. Um, Kez was the guy at receiver. He was really good. So, yeah, you're right. Kez was an All-American that year, uh, or close to it anyway. He was really good. The other guys, like, uh, what, Andre Cooper was young. E.G. Green was young. They were really good players, but they were young. So, anyway, you go into that game, you know you got a good defense. You know you've got two really good running backs. But I think Danny Cannell hadn't had one of those moments yet. It, I mean, it was his first year starting. so it, But he hadn't had one of those moments where he kind of galvanized the fan base. And then all of a sudden, so he'd already lost to Miami, down in Miami. And then this year, he's down 31-3 to to the other rival at home. And there are plenty of people, not that it was Cannell's fault necessarily, but there were plenty of people that were uh, maybe hoping to see number 12, Thad Busby, come to the game in that series when it was 31-3. to he did not, and then thankfully, because Cannell caught fire, and the rest is history. Did you? I wonder back then, it, and I don't remember having conversations with Bowden, and may have, or you may have, if you remember, was it was Bowden ever close? Did he talk about how close he was to pulling Cannell for Busby in that game? I don't know that he ever talked about it, but I remember specifically the only reason my dad and I stayed when it after when it was thirty-one to three late in the third, late in the fourth quarter. The only reason we stayed our third quarter was to see Busby play. We wanted to see what he looked like against Florida. I mean, we knew the game was over. Everybody knew the game was over. We just wanted to see if Busby made made, made some uh, nice throws that got you excited about next year. And then all of a sudden, that first drive, it was the last drive of the third quarter that, that went into the fourth quarter. It started in the third quarter and then trickled over to the fourth quarter. I think Zach Crockett scored. All right, let's not, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. No, I know, but I'm saying well, once that down. happened, you're like, okay, well, yeah. they can't put him in now. And then after that, Cannell just kept completing yeah. passes and scoring touchdowns. I'll say one thing, looking back at that, I remember that Miami game and, and I went back and I tortured myself. We'll talk about it a little bit to go back and watch the first three quarters of the choke and dope, which I don't know if I've seen since I saw it live. Cause it's like, why would you want to watch that? But right. just how, how much the offensive line struggled. I mean, Miami's defensive line completely dominated Florida state in yeah. that game down to Miami. Now they had a great defensive line. I don't know if that was the Warren Sapp team or whatever they had back then. It was Warren Sapp yeah. 94. Miami. Yeah, Warren so yeah, I mean, they, they just were completely out of hand. Same thing with this. Ray and I want to ask, Dan, I'm going to ask Danny about this because he took a beating in this game. I mean, it's amazing how many times he stood in the pocket and just got pummeled in this game. So I mean, I really think the offensive line struggled a bit, and I think that's part of. The, you mentioned they had enough skill, talent, pretty good defense, but I think the line was about a year away from getting a little bit better. 
And then let's flip it a little bit to the other side. Let's talk about Florida that year. Florida came in a 94 preseason number one. They had everybody back. And a few weeks earlier, why they lost their number one rankings because they had another Bowden go down to Gainesville and win that game. And that was Terry Bowden, last minute comeback, beating, uh, beating the Florida Gators down there. Yeah, that was Patrick Nix was the quarterback. Yeah, oh, that was a that was a great, great, great game. Um, that was a really great game by Auburn. And I, you know, had midway through that season, Terry Dean was a Heisman candidate. He was the starting quarterback for them to start the season. He was the Heisman candidate. And then he had one bad game. Spurrier yanked him for Werfel, and then Werfel started the rest of the year. Um, so it, they had, you know, they were really, really talented. Javon Curse was on that team, I believe. I mean, they, you know, it was a Florida team in the mid '90s, man. They had a bunch of NFL dudes, just like Florida State did. Florida State had Derek Brooks. Miami had Warren Sapp and Ray Lewis. I mean, it was the glorious time in the state of Florida for college football. So, yeah, Florida was very good. And I remember specifically, this was years ago when I rewatched the game, <clears throat> when they scored their, their last touchdown to go up 31-3. to I remember Musburger making the case to pollsters, like, hey, guys, does this yeah, not look did. like the best team in the country to you? I know they lost. But how is Florida not going to get to play for the national championship? They look un unbelievable. And then obviously the next 28 points happen. But yeah, so that was where it was, was, uh, was Florida was, you, you know, they'd lost the one game. It kind of felt fluky. It wasn't Auburn earned the win, but it just seemed a little fluky. And then they go, they lose a heartbreaker. And then they come into Tallahassee and they're up 31 to three. Their fans are celebrating in the stands and, you're like, man, Florida might just be the best team in the country. And then it was an utter, utter collapse. And they might have had they went, and you're right. I remember when when I went back and watched this, by the end of the third quarter, you're right. Musburger is railing for Florida. He, and, and for a good point, if you come into a team like this, a top 10 Florida State team in their home stadium and blow them out, and you're currently ranked number four, that should push you up in the polls. And if you go that, remember that year was Nebraska, Miami. In yeah. the Orange Bowl, I think, playing for it all. But I got to think of one lost Florida team that would end the season beating Florida State big probably would have been in that matchup against Miami. I mean, I'm sorry, against Nebraska instead of Miami. Don't you think they would have jumped Miami, who's also a one lost team in the polls that year? Yeah, I think if Florida if Florida had gone into Tallahassee and, and finished off that game 38 to 3 or 38 to 10, yeah, I don't know how they would stay below Miami. And then all of a sudden, so you have Penn State out west. Mm -hmm. The problem is Penn State was undefeated too. So well, you split that'd be a split title if they beat if they beat Florida State blow them out and beat my and beat Nebraska at the end of the year there's no way they're not giving at least a piece of the title Florida that year yeah maybe I mean you you probably not but you know we it was so weird back then with with the yeah. way they did national championships who knows like if Penn State win Penn State won that Rose Bowl to go undefeated the reason they didn't win any share of the national championships because Nebraska was undefeated now if a one loss team had beaten Nebraska then who knows but yeah, yeah. so Florida was still in the running. Um, until, you know, like I said, until Zach Crockett scored that touchdown and then off they went. Uh, but you very good team. I think it's the ultimate Spurrier visor. I don't even know if he actually threw the visor in that game, but the shots of him in this fourth quarter is worth just go and watch it. The shots of him coming unglued, uh, not believing what he was seeing um, in that in that fourth quarter and just the look on his face of utter disgust is worth it just to go, just spend 20 minutes going and watching that fourth quarter, just for that alone. Yeah, he did. I went back and watched that. He he took the visor off, was about to throw it once, and caught himself. He did not oh, actually good. hit the ground. Um, but, yeah, you're right. There's several <laughs> views of him sitting there, basically, you know, kneeling down. The look, it just, it's like we talk about with momentum. You could just feel, you could feel it. He knew it was coming. There was nothing he could do about it. And yeah, it was, it was a beautiful thing to see. And a little bit more to backdrop, not too long ago earlier that season is when he coined the free shoes used at Florida State. So, I mean, the Florida-Florida State rivalry was at full steam at that point. Spurrier's doing what he does. He's, he's taking shots at Florida State. He's the ultimate competitor. You know, Florida State had beaten him, I think, four out of five or three out of four, whatever, going into that game. So, Florida State had really got the best of Florida at that point. So, obviously, Spurrier's feeling a little pressure. Yeah, and obviously he never. That was as close as he came to winning in Tallahassee. Was that one? Um, and he had, you know, he had his chance, and that was the chance. You're up thirty-one to three with an incredible defense, and um, and yeah, you know, that was that was some that was part of the narrative of Steve Spurrier of his career at Florida, as good as it was, and it was it was really good. He turned that program around um, into a national power. He never beat Florida State at Florida State, and his only his record against Florida, Bobby, I think, was three seven and one. Or something like that. I, I think his record against, uh, uh, I think it was three seven and one, or at least in that decade, 
in the nineties, I think I think Florida won three games. I think they won ninety five, yeah. ninety six, and ninety one. I think that ninety seven. So they were four seven and one. So Florida back then in the nineties didn't have a losing record against anyone. So for them to go a whole decade and play Florida State in twelve games in the nineties, because after this game, obviously they had the rematch in the yeah. in the Sugar Bowl, and then they had the rematch in ninety six. For him to win four out of twelve games against another team is yeah. an impossibility. As good as that Florida team was, but that you right. know Bowden Bowden a little bit had his number. Now you know they did get lucky to get to play them again in '96, uh, and half the team, half the Florida State team had the flu, but that was a great, great Florida team. Yeah, and we we can but, share uh, that for another time because I think that that's a game that I, I I threw it out there in the list of people to vote on because I think it gets a sh- it doesn't get the credit it deserves that '96 because Florida State. I mean that was the ultimate Florida team. I mean they were that was the best team Spur ever had. They came into Tallahassee. Florida State beat them, and it was an incredible victory. That's when the goalposts came down, and everyone yeah. had just a big party in Tallahassee. But then, of course, a lot of series of odd events happened, and they were able to sneak back in and get what I call the mulligan game against Florida State. And then, like you said, had the flu and all that. But I think fans dismissed that game because of the, Florida got the rematch. And Florida doesn't get that rematch. I think that goes down as one of the top two or three all-time games in Florida State history. Oh, for sure. It was number one versus number two. Like, legit number one versus number two. And I think... I think Florida was the favorite. Like they were. Was, there was nobody ever came into Doak in the '90s and was favored. I mean, that was that might have been. I'm sure that was the only time in the in the in the whole decade that Florida State was an underdog at home. That's how good that Florida team was. And uh, Werfel was good. And obviously, those receivers could really play. So uh, yeah. So it was. It's also odd that you had a decade where you 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 had two rematches. You had two rematches within the span of three years with the same team. Mm-hmm. You played them two times in a row. Which is ne- it's never going to happen again in, in college football. It really won't. There's no way it could happen again in college football that you're going to play the same team two times in a row at the end of the regular season, and then um, and then in the bowl game for the national championship in '96. And this one was what they call it the fifth quarter in the French Quarter. Is yep. that what they called it? Um, and uh, so yeah, uh, I, you know that game kind of gets lost too. That Florida State actually went on and actually beat them a month later because this game is an all timer. This game was a college football history. This game is a uh, is one that Florida State fans will always remember. The one, the one problem I always have, Gene, and it's kind of over your shoulder. And I mentioned it earlier about that Florida collapsed. Is it became the choke and doke, which I get. It's funny to poke fun at Florida, but Florida State also went and played really well. You know what I mean? It wasn't like Florida just kept throwing pick sixes, um, like uh, LSU did to Auburn. I think maybe that same year, where LSU had a big lead at Auburn at, at Auburn, and then just threw like th- just kept throwing interceptions. Florida State went and won that game. They just marched down the field, and they kept getting stops. So it was a choke, absolutely, but it was also uh, a team storming back. Uh, they took advantage of it. and, I, and uh, So I always thought that I, I like it's a great nickname for the game, and everybody knows what you're talking about, and it's fun to poke fun at your rivals. Um, but the Florida State team in that fourth quarter really did make some incredible plays to oh, win yeah, that game. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk about, break down some of those plays here coming up in a minute with uh, the young quarterback at the time that orchestrated the greatest comeback in Florida State history, and that is, of course, Danny Cannell. So we'll be right back with uh, FSU great Danny Cannell. You can hear him on Sirius XM in the afternoons. Even now, Danny Cannell, I think you've, uh, is it one to three you're on uh, Mad Dog Radio? Yep, one to three, and we are basically making it up as we go. Like we every every show, like we do a pre-show call a few hours before, and we're just dying. Like maybe there was a draft rumor that was going around that we could base the show around that. But hey, we've also had some fun. You know, we've recapped the Tiger King on Netflix, which I'm sure everybody's sure. heard of if you haven't sure. seen it. So we're we're basically just making things up as we go, like everybody else in this kind of new normal, I guess, is what we're uh, calling it. Where did you guys come down on it, Danny? Did you think she killed her husband? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, she definitely did. Like she kind of, if OJ Simpson can figure it out, he's out there, he says it, and he's an expert in the field, sure. then I'm going to sure. lean his way as well. But it Absolutely. was funny because my wife and I, she only made it through about three episodes, and she gave up because she would not believe that it was reality TV. She thought there's it was too bizarre. They had to be yeah. actors playing crazy people. And I was trying to tell her, I'm like, these people exist. And so she gave up on it. I plowed through the whole series. It's incredible. If the people haven't seen it, watch it. Um, it's infuriating at times. It's <laughs> funny. And it's uh, it's just bizarre. It's like these people live among amongst us. 
If I only had some free time. Oh, wait, I do. I guess yeah, I'll have to watch. Yeah, you plenty of free time, man. <laughs> All right, well, let, let's try to talk a little sports because, I mean, there isn't sports, but there's some great FSU games we can look back on. Of course, we're talking about 1994, the tie between Florida and Florida State, a.k.a. the choke in Doak. And, uh, Danny, let me start out talking about that. I went, I forced myself to go back and watch the first three quarters. I've seen the fourth quarter 50 times. I don't think since I sat in the stands and watched that game, I have not seen the first three quarters. So I went back and looked, and tell me this is the beginning of the game, kind of the feel going in. You had... I think Florida had just lost to Auburn a few weeks before, but they were ranked number four. You guys are number seven. It's Spurrier. It's Bowden. Kind of what was the vibe? Is it just a typical – that was the height of the 90s in the battle between Florida and Florida State. What was that like coming in? Uh, like you said, I mean, this was – and there were two weeks that were always different, and it was the Miami week and it was the Florida week. And whether you played them at home or on the road, it just – it was that much, you know, of a bigger deal – for me, because that year, you know, I don't know, I'm sure you guys remember this, but in the Orange Bowl at Miami was really my first big start in one of these rivalry games, and I played awful. Like, I had three picks, and I got benched at the Orange Bowl. So this is later in the season. So I had played a little bit better, but still was, like, wasn't exactly making people forget about Charlie Ward or what the offense was <laughs> capable of doing. So I was coming in still like trying to find my footing as the leader of the team, as the quarterback of the team, as kind of, hey, let's let's silence any critics of what I can do in the big game because, you know, let's be honest, a lot of guys could have gone out there and put up numbers versus some of the other teams in the ACC. And when you're a Florida State quarterback, you're judged on how do you play against Florida and how do you play against Miami? And so going in, I was nervous, you know, like I would get for big games, but I also felt like there was a lot at stake as far as it's the last game of the regular season. You know, you want to finish strong. It's a rivalry game. You're playing at home. Um, you know, and so I wanted to play really well. And I don't know if that was why I was playing so God awful the first three quarters, but it just, it could not have gone any worse. And I'm sorry you sat through that. I don't think I've even forced myself to sit <laughs> through that because all I want to talk about is the fourth quarter, but it was, it was bad. I mean, I, the thing that sticks out to me is I think was it 28 to 3 at half? I think it was 28 to 3 at halftime, if I'm not mistaken. It was 24 yeah. to 24 to 3. Or whatever the whatever the score was. Yeah. I'm walking in and I remember just getting booed, like going through the tunnel. Yeah. And they're like, you suck. And you know, of course there's always fans there, they're gonna voice that opinion. And I it doesn't bother me, but I just I remember that. And I remember thinking, this sucks. Like this is awful. And then in the locker room, I remember seeing Mark Richt huddle up with Bobby Bowden and they were having a conversation and, you know, going about the game plan on kind of what was unfolding. And I came to find out later, like that was the conversation that was deciding, do we stay with Danny or do we go with Thad Busby to start the second half? After they have this meeting, Mark Rick comes over. He goes, we're not going to bench you. We're going to, but he's like, but we need to play better or you're going to be. And I was like, oh, crap, like, here we go. Um, but thankfully, they let me kind of ride out the storm. In the third quarter, we did see some positive play a little bit better, but it wasn't like we were putting up a lot of points. Um, but it was enough to kind of just barely hang on to the job. And then, you know, once we got to the fourth quarter, the rest is history. I told the story already, Danny, but I was in the stands with my dad. I was, uh, what would I have been, 19 at the time. And the only reason we stayed was to see what Thad Busby would do in the fourth quarter. <laughs> You know what I mean? And I think there were some fans there and I wasn't one of the ones booing you. I just, he was the, he was the freshman. You're, you're thinking, okay, well, this guy was uh, really hyped coming out of, coming out of high school. I'm sure he's going to get some mop up duty here in the fourth quarter. Let's just see how he does. And that's the only reason we were excited to stay. Do you feel in the moment, you know, you, you had, you had the unenviable task of replacing the most popular player in Florida state history. Like literally the guy that won the Heisman, the guy that won a national championship. Can you feel that maybe you haven't been in Britain? And I know you were just talking about being booed, but going into that fourth quarter, it didn't feel like you were beloved as a Florida State quarterback. Some of that had to do with maybe how you were playing that day, but a lot of it had to do, I think, with who you had to replace. Oh, without question. I mean, Charlie set the bar so high because he played so great, was the first Heisman Trophy winner, brings the first national championship, like all these different things. And he's a great guy, 
um, you know, he is this perfect figure to kind of elevate Florida State to the next level. And I knew what I was walking into. Like, I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but I felt like one of the things that I guess I had going for me, and I kind of played this with the media and told them this, is, look, I can never be Charlie Ward. I just, I don't have the skill set that he has. I wasn't as good a runner. We're different styles of play, but I firmly believe that I could still have success because we had so much talent around me. But right. That doesn't mean like, and again, it goes back to the statement I made earlier. You're judged by how you play against Miami and how you play against Florida. And because the first half was so bad, I think people's belief, and rightly so, was he's not the quarterback for us because he can't get it done against the good teams or the great teams. And that's where you get judged. So I was aware of this kind of pressure dynamic that was unfolding and was very well aware that Thad Busby was you know, a fan favorite as the backup quarterback always is. Right. And so I, I was aware of that pressure and essentially I got to a point and I don't think I've ever gotten to this point at any other point in my career where it just got so bad. I was literally like, screw it. Like it can't get any worse. Let's just go play and see what happens. So I wasn't playing afraid. Cause I was like, eh, if I throw in an interception, I'm just going to get benched again. And that's probably it. But I like, it was this close. So I was like, well, right. all right, well, I might get benched if I go three and out. So I might as well just cut it loose. Um, and I was very just at a free place because like as bad as it was, I didn't feel the pressure because I didn't really think a comeback was reality. I just thought, Let's just try to not embarrass myself. And that was really my message to my teammates in the locker room was we can't get embarrassed on our home field. We just have to go out and we can't get embarrassed. Like we have to make this respectable. And what respectable to me looked like was probably cutting the lead to, you know, to 14 where we, we the scoreboard is respectable at the end. But, you know, I don't think when, when I'm telling everybody that in the, in the locker room or on the sideline, hey, let's just not get embarrassed. I think that was really the belief. That was the rallying cry was we can't get blown out at home. We can get beat, but let's just not go down without a fight. Like that was the origination right. of the choke it dope was we're not going to get embarrassed. We're going to put up a fight and then we'll see what happens. So you Gene, start that. Oh, go ahead, Gene. Yeah, I was going to say, let, let's jump ahead to the good stuff. I don't know if Corey, you want to follow up, but I want to set the stage here because it's all this first three quarters. Like you said, we don't need to talk about that too much. OK, there's two minutes, six seconds left. In the third quarter, you get the ball back. You're down 31 to three. And the thing I noticed when I went back and looked at this again, there were in that drive, you dumped it off four times between Warwick Dunn and Rock Preston. I, my first question about that drive was that something was that checkoffs by you? Is that something Mark Rick said? Because they were they were pounding you, Danny. You were getting hit a lot in that game. Was that a game plan at that point, an adjustment to start dumping the ball off to the running backs more? No. So I would say, and Mark Rick's one of the best, you know, like he was awesome for me throughout my career. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm, you know, not, not taking a knock at him, but explaining the offense was that was just the progression was, you know, and we ran a shallow cross series, which is kind of what we, it was, what we called it, it was the shallow cross series. And it would, the, basically the very simplest proje- um, progression was there was a shallow crosser and I would hit him if he was open there was a curl behind it, and I would hit him if he was open. And if neither of them were open, I would hit the swing on the outside. And now on the other side, there was an option to possibly throw a little hot route or a fade route, which I actually hit later to a couple guys. Um, but on those, I was just reading my progression. And because Florida was in total prevent mode, they were sinking back. They were just under the mindset of let's just keep everybody in front of us. Don't give up the big play. So I would see the shallow cross and there'd be a, you know, a zone defender kind of sitting right where he was going to be. So I was like, well, that's not good. The curl route was crowded because they were dropping into those zones. And so they just kept dropping back. And all I had to do was flip it out to those guys and, you know, and they could make guys miss and we could start moving the chains and getting completions, getting completions. What I think was the thing that was so valuable to me because when you're a quarterback struggling with your confidence, you need something to boost it. And you can't just say, believe in yourself or, you know, just make a play. You actually have to see positive plays eventually start to happen. So for me, getting those easy completions was starting to build up my confidence in myself again, saying, hey, I can complete this. We can move the ball. And then the other thing it did is once they started to come up and defend those, which they never really did, to be honest. 
it did open up some other avenues and some other route combinations and even some of the other options, the shallow crosser or the curl or other routes in that system. So on that first have- drive, Danny, uh, the first touchdown drive, do you remember the biggest play? It was probably the biggest play of the game in hindsight. Do you remember it? You guys had a fourth and 10. And obviously you're not kicking a field goal to make it 31 to six. And let's be honest, you guys didn't kick field goals real well that year anyway. Yep. Do you remember the play, who you threw it to? I, I would just wonder for somebody so like you. So the fourth and 10, is that the, is that the play that was the Kez McCorvey, I think? Was yes. that the fourth and 10? Yeah. yeah. So that was, so this is where I go back and I look at, and that was 60 Y option was the play. Kez was the Y and he was going to, if it was man coverage, he would break it out. If it was zone coverage, he would curl it up. But because of that time, when, because we were getting closer and closer to the end zone, there wasn't right. quite as much room. So I had to throw it probably earlier than I would have liked. And it because he couldn't quite get as deep, it was right there. And I'm telling you, if there was instant replay, I don't know if it's a first down. Like, I think, you know, it was really close. It could have right. gone either way. Um, but we did get the first down call, which was massive because I firmly believe this. If there are so many plays like that one um, that if you don't get that, the comeback doesn't happen. Like if we don't get that, if we turn the ball, there's probably not enough time to do what we did later. So that's just one of probably about 10 or 12 plays that were made that if they, if he drops it or if the, or if the, you know, if the ref doesn't spot it as a first down, the ball's turned over, we're done. Like we, like we don't come back and there's a ton of those types of plays in there. So then Zach Crockett scores right on that drive gene. Yeah. Zach Crockett scores there to cut it to 31 to 10. Now, the next series is unbelievable to me. There's 1037 left. By the, in the way, game. remember yeah. remember that play for later. I'll just give you a little teaser. Okay. That was 30 That's trap. Remember that play for All later. Right. All right. 1037 <laughs> left in the game. You guys are down 31 to 10. You put together a three play drive in 33 seconds for a touchdown. You hit Kez, 35 yards, work done, another drop opt in for 20 yards, and then you hit Andre Cooper in the end zone. I mean, that's. Against a team that's playing prevent, that's crazy in three plays in 33 seconds. And again, like I would put this drive itself as the most critical one yeah. because of how quick it was. Because it was three plays. We had the little play action pass where Kez kind of was coming over across. We had the, the play to work done, which I think was when I threw that to him and saw what he did on the sideline, it was very reminiscent of the play he made in 93 in Gainesville when he was juking defenders on the sideline and that one he took to the house. So it was very similar to me when I'm watching that unfold. I'm like, this guy's awesome, which everybody knows work done was. And then we had a, we had a play call and we called it smoke uh, at the time. And that was the, the touchdown pass to Andre Cooper. And we had several of these built in where I would just yell. I would start yelling as soon as war done goes out of bounds, I'm starting to yell smoke, smoke, smoke. And everybody goes like even faster than no huddle, line up at the line of scrimmage, and we run this this sprint right, you know, kind of play where Kez is there and he's, or excuse me, um, Andre Cooper is going to run this little kind of like you know ten yard comeback to the uh, to the like right at the goalpost, and then there's going to be a corner route behind him, and we usually. I would say probably if we ran smoke, we probably, I don't know, it was probably 50-50. I wouldn't say, but we did like to hit the corner route behind it if there was more room, but it was a little bit tight. And if you watch the video, the official is like trying to, because he was kind of out of place and he's trying to get out of the way of the play so he can officiate. And I like have to redirect just a little bit out of the way because I almost hit him. But that kind of shows you how quickly we went up to the ball. The official wasn't even really ready to, to call the game. And I like run like right in his way, but make the play. Andre catches it, touchdown. But that drive to me was probably the most critical drive of the four because it was so fast. We had to have one like that. A quick strike doesn't quick strike doesn't take anything off the clock, and boom, we're right back in it. That was after that drive, and the message no longer was, hey, let's not embarrass ourselves. The message was we can actually do this. And don't you think, obviously, I know that pumped up your sideline to think, wait, there's still 10 minutes left. We're only down two scores, and we have the highest scoring offense in the country. We can win this thing. Not only does it give you belief, but doesn't that flip to the other sideline like, oh, sh**. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. We might we might lose this. Oh, no, this is a real game now. We thought we had, we still got 10 minutes left, and we only got a two-score lead. Don't you think the other sideline starts feeling that a little bit, too? 
Corey, 100%. And I also think, so I think it puts the pressure on them. And I've all, I've, I've believed this to this day. I think in the, in to the toughest place to play football is with a lead, like a two touchdown or a three touchdown lead, because you're in this comfort zone where you're supposed to win the game. And yet if you start playing not to lose, that's right. the minute you're going to make yourself vulnerable. And like the best coaches I played for, like Mike Shannon with the Broncos was the best at going for the jugular. Doesn't matter. We could be up three touchdowns. He wants to make it four. Um, and yet kind of knowing how to play call so that you don't screw that up. Um, but I definitely th- felt like Spurrier um, and the Gators started to feel that way. And then it made them, you know, Danny Warfel didn't throw too many picks. And, you know, they had the James Colsey interception where he makes the incredible diving catch. And they were all, you know, not on the same page communicating. But it just kind of, they started calling and game planning and just executing things that they normally didn't. So you could definitely tell it was flipping. But I think even more importantly was the fans started to get into it and the defense started to feed off it too. And, you know, I've, I've gone back and watched the TV copy and, um, you know, Brent Musburger and Dick Vermeil, and they're saying, hey, look at how this defense all of a sudden has woken right. up because of what the offense has been doing. Then that couldn't have been more true. Or that's why, you know, as much as the offense gets credit for the choke it doke, the defense deserves just as much because they started coming up with big plays, turnover creating plays, and started to get the ball back to us quickly. And so when they're coming off the field from getting a turnover, they're like, get it back. Let's go score and we'll get you back the ball again. And it kind of became this real contagious attitude of, hey, something special could be brewing. What do they do on that next drive, Gene? The well, this is they, go- they get the ball back after a short period of time. And then, Danny, you have another methodical drive down. But, of course, the memory I think everybody has is when you guys got down on the goal line. And the last person you'd expect to score did, and that's you, uh, on that little bootleg play. I mean, just Brett, what was the, what was the call there? Uh, just give us that situation. How did that play out? So that was a little play that we ran, because we were running these runs, like either 15 or 16, uh, to the right or left, to Warwick Dunn, so we could generate some sort of run game from the shotgun. And so we couldn't let teams realize, and this is the genius and innovation of Mark Richt and the offensive staff, was... Well, even if Danny can't run, which I couldn't, uh, we have to have some sort of play action off it. So I, we, were, we would call it a 15 naked. And so I would stick it in his belly and I would come out and there would be a little uh, inside bounce route was what we called it. There would be an outside comeback and then there would be somebody dragging across the field at the second level behind him. And I would say most of the time, the easiest throw for me was we fooled them and I'd hit the little bounce route to either Kez or EG in the slot and they'd run it, turn it up. Occasionally, I'd get out to the outside, maybe hit the deep crosser, and then occasionally hit the outside. Never in a million years did I ever think about running it. But I came out and really, it just kind of like hit me. I'm like, I think I can get in. Like it just, they had covered because teams had started to scout for us. And so they had started to realize, all right, that first inside route is this bounce route. So they had covered that one. And then because that defender gets pulled out, I'm right there. And Kevin Carter, who's a friend of mine, he works with me at CBS Sports. um, He was the end and he had been fooled by the fake. And so he's trying to redirect, which, and don't tell him this, because I always tell him it was my sheer speed that outran him to the end zone. But I, he had to redirect, and I had the advantage of just running to the end zone. And my thought was, I can make it, and I just can get to the goal line and get down and protect myself so I don't fumble or anything. And that's exactly what I did. Just dove straight down for the goal line. And, you know, I, I, I want to say it might be my only rushing touchdown at, at probably at Florida State, maybe in my entire career. Like, I, I, just, I did not like running. I was always going to try to throw it to the athletes instead of try to be one. But... You know, again, it's one of those plays that just happened to unfold the way it did. And if I'm tackled short, if the clock keeps running, like, does that mess things up? You know, it's just one of those plays that kind of goes our way. And it was kind of all right. And then that one. So and I'll I'll cheat a little bit forward. Or do you guys want to hit on what happened to the defense? Yeah, we can do the defense. But also, did that have anything to do with Zach Crockett? That play it or did. That so up? it did. So when I, that's what I was going to get to. So when I came over to the sideline and every time, like, cause I would talk on the headset to Mark Rick, who was upstairs and coach Bowden would come over and kind of just check on me and say, good job. 
And then I get more into the X and O's and kind of what we're going to do on the next drive. So I go over to the headset on this one and we're down seven. And Coach Rick is like, all right, when we score, he's like, we're going to go for two. And this was, you know, so because so he tells me on my headset. So I'm like, yeah, I'm like, no question. I'm like, definitely. I'm like, and he's like, we're going to run 30 trap if we score. We're, that's going to be our two point play. That was the play that Zach Crockett had run in for the first touchdown of the game. So I was pumped and I, I didn't even tell anybody because they don't need to know. But I, right. but it's in. So go to the defense. And we'll come back to that. <laughs> OK, yeah. So um, they get the ball back. I think they get a first down. It might have been their only they first do. down of yeah. the quarter. They get a first down. I think maybe they hit Doring for a first down. And then they throw it again because Spur, I think Spurrier understands we can't run the clock out on these guys. They're gonna, they're swarming us right now. We're not running on them. We've got to make plays with Danny. And then Colsey makes, I think he had a big interception the year before in the swamp too. He he loved playing the Gators, but he has a great, it might've been the best catch of the day was Colsey's over the shoulder diving interception. So talk about, so he gets the interception. I think it's around the 30, your own 30, 25. What are when you're going to the hut? I mean, you guys didn't huddle necessarily, so right. I don't know if you're giving a big rah rah speech to the offensive linemen when they go on the field. But what is your mindset personally when you see that interception? I don't know if you're standing on the sideline or if you're sitting on the bench. If you when you see that interception, and then as you drop trot onto the field, what's going through your head as the quarterback? So we didn't really, you know, like you said, we weren't huddling, but the time we would get together as an offense was over on the sideline which was usually on a, on a turnover like that, you know, because we're all going nuts, giving Colsey high fives, what a great play. But then, like, as we're getting focused on what we're going to do the next drive, we're kind of over there. We're talking with Jeff Bowden, who was the receivers coach, and Coach Bowden is right there, and Mark Rick is talking to them through the headset. And I'm telling you, to a man, we all knew we were going to score. Like, at that point, like, it wasn't about respect. It was, we've got them on, our, on their heels, we, we can do this. Everything we were calling was working. So at that point, it was, let's just go finish. Like, let's go do this. And it was just an incredible atmosphere. The fans could feel it. We could feel it. And it just, like, that was probably the best feeling of it because we really didn't get to enjoy a victory because of the tie. But at that moment, it was like, we are going to do this. So we had a very confident mindset when we went out to the field for that drive, without question. And what, Gene, wasn't the biggest play a swing pass to Warwick? Who exactly. He had those, I think that was one of those. He had several in the game, but it was one of those little sideline moves. I think he made two guys miss on the sideline. who should have had him out of bounds. So you, got, you guys got that long chunk play right off the bat. So you guys were in great shape. I think you hit Rock for one. You had a couple down there to the goal line. And uh, what, what I love about the finish here is because I know Rock Preston early on had that fumble. And that's thing when I went back and looked, I was surprised. You guys were moving ball well the first quarter. You moved it right down the field, got a field goal in the first one. You moved it right down the field. You're going in for a touchdown. Rock Preston fumbles. And then he gets the opportunity to tie the game. What was that what Was that play call? Was that something that came down from Rick? And what was, what was the thinking on that play? So we had a design. We had, some, we had a run series, really a check with me series, where um, I would call the run, and it was going to be a strong side run or a weak side run, according to where the defensive line was uh, lined up. And so we had called the run play. We got the defense we wanted, ran it to the weak side, and Rock ran it in. And I don't, I don't even know if I thought it was going to get in for a touchdown, but he just kind of kept going. It was like, oh, and then he did that dance, which was one of the epic dances you know we've seen maybe in Florida State history. He took his helmet off. Today would probably be a 15-yard penalty. Yeah. Um, but he'd have been, been kicked so, out of the game today. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. He probably would have. So remember my conversation mm -hmm. with Mark Richt on the headset about going for two. So I really wasn't celebrating. I was right. trying to frantically run around. Because remember, no, I didn't tell anybody we were going for two. So most people are just, when your mindset after a touchdown and, you know, most offensive linemen, they're gassed, they're tired. They just want to get some water, you know, celebrate, get over to the, you know, get ready for the next series. I am frantically running around yelling two. We're going for two, like screaming, like, because it's loud. But I want to make sure we have time to get lined up, to call this play. And so I'm running all over and I forget who it was, but one of my offense, like one of my offensive linemen looked at me and pointed over to the sideline and coach Bowden was out like on the field, like four or five yards. And he was just holding up one finger. And you knew what that meant. It was like, we're kicking it. And then Dan Mowry's coming on the field and we're getting ready to kick it. And so I was, I was a little bit defeated, 
because I was so like, I feel like there was no way they were going to stop us. And I don't like any play call we would have run. I don't think they would have stopped us. But at the same time, like it's coach Bowden, we're just going to, you know, and I wasn't, I didn't go voice any like, Hey, I like, let's change the call. But it was like, Oh man, we're not going to go for two. Um, and then we make it and we tie it up and everybody's going nuts. And there was a little bit of time left on the clock. Well, and I was wondering about that when you talk about going for two. When did you guys score? Was like a minute 45 left when they scored that That's time? Yeah, touchdown? minute 45, Corey. So yeah. that is kind of early to go for two, only in the sense that if you get it, then Florida's going to go four downs. They're not punting it back. Right. So they would have never punted back to you guys in that situation. They would have just kept going for it. And you never know, then they maybe they get in position for a field goal. But, you know, people gave Bowden a little bit of grief for uh, for kicking the extra point to tie the game. Number one, we all remembered, at least we did, remembered 87 in the Miami game. Uh, but also, you know, nobody made Spurrier punt. Like, he could have tried to go for it, too, if he didn't want to settle for a tie. So I, I thought, and Bowden even said that after, the Coach Bowden even said that after the game. Like, hey, he punted. Like, he, he must have been okay with the tie. But wow. I wondered what the players thought about it because I've seen the video of the locker room afterwards. It didn't look like a tied locker room. It looked like you guys had just won in the swamp in 93 locker room. Like y'all were very, very excited. Right? Wasn't that the but you still got the oh, you still for got the ball sure. back. Like the only the only like in that moment, I was bummed. Like as I'm like, running off the field. And then I was kind of still but again, my mindset was we're gonna get it back. Like we're gonna right. get the ball, we're gonna get one more chance. So that was my mindset then, um, which we did. But at the time, I think everybody was in the defense was there. Like, you know, when you have that dynamic, when you're running across the field and the offense is running off and the defense is running on, they're saying, we're going to stop them. We're going to get the ball back. You guys be ready. We're going to get it back. And so that was kind of the next progression of, because there really wasn't, like I never really celebrated throughout the fourth quarter because in, in the beginning of it, I was embarrassed. And then the middle of it, I'm starting to think we can do something special. And then at the end of it, I'm still thinking this isn't over yet. So I had never really celebrated. I was just hyper-focused on what can we do next? Like, what is the next thing? And at that point, it was let's get the ball back and see if we can make something crazy happen. And so you got the ball back, I think, with, what, like 25 seconds left or somewhere like that. With not like at your own 30, 35. Yeah. And, Danny, I'm telling you, I, you made a lot of great throws. That that fourth quarter, the one you made on that drive, literally you came so close to throwing it right to a Florida defender. I don't remember who caught it, but you lobbed it probably a half a foot over him. And it was a nice play. I don't remember who you – do you remember this play I'm talking Dad. about? Oh, yeah, I remember the play. So we ran – we ran basically it was a Hail Mary um, type of formation type of play where it's drawn up where basically it looks like three guys are going to just – you know, run as far as right. I can, and I'm going to heave it, except for Kez, he breaks it off short. And so he breaks it off underneath and just makes a little out route because you're expecting them to play Hail Mary defense, which they they pretty much were. So they were all backed up, but the plan was to go to Kez. And there was a flat defender that was there, and it was one where I didn't think about it at the time, but it, I agree with you. It was like right over his head. He goes out of bounds. And it was a big pickup. Like yeah. all of a sudden we're getting close to midfield where a long field goal comes in. Now we can actually reach the end zone with a Hail Mary throw potentially. Um, and so then we get then we get the ball back. And then we have this one more play. And I forget how many seconds. Was it 17 seconds or 15? I forget how many seconds were left. But there was still some time yeah. left. Go ahead. And then yeah. You Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, yeah. At that point, yeah, you're right. It, it was in the teens, and I know at that point, you ran it. And you got to the 41 yard line. You were one. It, it, it stopped, you know, the clock stops, and all you had to do is get one more yard. You got the timeout. You probably have yep. eight, ten seconds left time for an out route or something to get yourself in field goal range and win the game. So I mean, that's that's how close that was to you guys winning that one. And again, I don't think I had ever scrambled. Like that might have been one of my only <laughs> scrambles that were positive yards. Mm -hmm. Maybe I had a a false sense of confidence from the touchdown run. But I was like, yeah, I can get this first down. No problem. And I thought I did. Like if there would have been a goal line, like I could have dove over it and made sure I got it. But it just like, I didn't like, and I was getting tackled, but I, I would have made a better concerted effort to get the first. I just like, I felt I ran for 50 yards cause I never ran the ball. So to me, it felt like I clear there was a first down, no problem. But there was, and I'm not that, you know, you guys know, I was a statue, so I wasn't used to my 
placement on the field that much. To me, it felt like I was going to get the first. So I went down, and I'm trying to get everybody lined up at the line of scrimmage to spike it so we can get off one more play, whether it's a field goal, which right. would have been a bomb, or a Hail Mary, and I'm trying to do it. And then, as you guys know, the clock ends and the game's over. And at that moment, I was bummed. Like, I was like, man, if we could have had one more play, whether it was a field goal or a Hail Mary, it just was like, at that moment, to me personally, I was like, man, this sucks. Like, I didn't want to tie. But then, like, you start to go in and you start to realize what we accomplished and you start to, like, see, okay, we didn't lose. Like, that was almost <laughs> – it was so important to us that we didn't get embarrassed and we did do something special. And then, you know, as reporters were asking me questions about, hey, this might have been one of the greatest comebacks of all time, you know, then it starts to set in. And for me personally – you know, I was just glad I didn't get benched. I was like, hey, right. goodness. you know, I get to start another game. Like I hang on to my job for one more game. And so it was just this one big, massive sigh of relief when it was all said and done. Yeah, I wanted to say like midway through the fourth quarter, Danny, me and my dad weren't looking for Thad Busby anymore. Right, right. We were like, okay, we'll ride with 13 for a little while longer. Right, um, exactly. Ask- and it was huge for my career. Like it definitely, because if I didn't, Maybe Thad comes in and maybe he leads a comeback. Maybe he leads us to a club, but he maybe he wins the job and I never play again. Like that's how I think close it was to me, the direction of my career path with if I don't, if they don't stick with me for the second half. And it was, it would have been easy for them to bench me at that time. Easy. Cause everybody would have been, yeah, it just isn't working out. Let's right. give that a shot. Like it would have been and easy. I was going to ask real quick. He scored the game tying touchdown. People all know about work done. And they all know about you. They all know about Kez, Derek Brooks, Derek Alexander, Corey Ford. There's a ton of big names from that team. Rock Preston, there's a lot of people watching this that probably don't know the name or haven't seen a lot of his highlights. How good was that dude? Because I contend he is one of the best. I, I, he's the best backup running back in the history of college, but he was unbelievable. I mean, he was, I think he's probably one of the most underrated history uh, players in the history of Florida State football for what he meant to the program. Uh, And him and, I would say, and this is not a knock against Warwick Dunn, this is more of a praise for Rock Preston. I think the coaches viewed it as, you know, as a 1A, 1B type of situation where there wasn't going to be much drop-off. They were pretty much interchangeable. Now, clearly, Warwick was the guy. He was the bulk of the ball carrier. But Rock Preston, there was zero um, question if Warwick couldn't, you know, was tired. They right. weren't going to change the play calls. They were going to do everything the exact same. And if Rock goes to a different university, you know, who knows how his career could have ended up? Because I don't think he got a fair shake when it was all said and done at the next level. And probably it was because he didn't get enough, you know, ball c- carries to showcase what he could truly do. But trust me, we all knew what he was, what he meant to. And he was also a guy who was really a locker room favorite because, and you guys know Warwick. Warwick is one of my favorite teammates I've ever played with, but he's out of the same cloth as Charlie Ward, which is very quiet, very soft-spoken. And Rock is joking around, like uh, lovable, you know, uh, energetic. Like he's kind of the opposite. So from that standpoint, he was one of the favorites in the locker room as well. Everybody loved Rock and he's awesome. I ran into him. A few years ago in South Florida, I ran into him and he's doing great. I saw him and he's, again, like he's one of my favorite teammates too, just for the the type of guy he was and what he brought. I think he's totally underappreciated. Well, and it says a lot about him, right? That he was on the field for the game tying touchdown. They had 28 on the sideline feeling perfectly okay. Now, I think if Warwick Dunn scores the game tying touchdown, he probably doesn't take off his helmet and do the dance. (laughs) (laughs) Right. No, I don't think so either. I don't think so either. It wouldn't have been that memory. (laughs) <laughs> Danny, you've got now you've got 25 plus years to look back at this now. And you said at the time you were upset, went for one, you guys got the tie, even though you guys sell obviously the players celebrated, the fans were nuts with it. I remember there was uh, somebody asked Spear after the game what it felt like to lose a tie. And right. then you guys got the opportunity then to go in the Sugar Bowl and play them again, which was dubbed the fifth quarter in the French quarter. So a lot of fans at least felt like you guys beat the Gators twice that year. And now looking back in hindsight, now I know you're confident you would have gotten that two pointer and beaten him. But at this point, are you still, if you could go back in time, would you have gone for two points at this point? Um, you, the hindsight is 2020. It looks great. I, I would have gone for it just because I felt there was no way they were going to stop us. Like it was that much confidence. But 
in Coach Bowden's wisdom, he was able to see the bigger picture. And there are two favorite moments of mine that are very subtle um, from the game. One is when you watch the game clock, when I'm, when I'm trying to spike the ball and the clock goes to zero and the, the refs are like, the game is over, it's a tie. If you watch the TV copy, there's a gator helmet that goes like, whoop, like it just, like somebody <laughs> chucks it and it's like a 40 yard <laughs> chuck. Like somebody had an awesome arm, but it's one of the Florida Gator defenders. That's one of my favorite things because that should show you all you need to know. Like the Gator defender is so pissed, he chucks his helmet like 30 <laughs> yards and you can just see it like across the bottom of the screen. I don't even know who it was. The other one was Coach Bowden's post game interview when he's talked by the sideline reporter and they ask him, um, you know, his first comment was, this was a great win for, and he goes, uh, I mean, Ty, like in Coach Bowden, I don't know if he did it on purpose or not. He, he probably did because he's so savvy, but you know, that those two moments to me kind of summed it up. Like it was absolutely a win for us. And even going to New Orleans for that fifth quarter at the, uh, at the French quarter, we just had that confidence carried over where we knew we were the better team. We knew we could execute. We knew what we were capable of. And they were a team that probably wasn't thrilled about having to face us again, right? Like so that, And then, I don't know if you guys remember this, they had a fight at their team meeting, yeah. like another player took a butter knife to a guy. Oh, when right. we heard that news, we were like, oh, this thing is done. It's a wrap. There's no <laughs> chance they're going to beat us. <laughs> did you get, last thing, Danny, did you get any extra? You said some memories. When you're seeing this transpire, other times you guys played forward, when you looked at that sideline, because earlier that season, Spurrier called you guys free shoes, you, and he was always fun at taking jabs at you guys. And Bowden was always great about deflecting it, and he thought it was great. Did you get some extra satisfaction when you would look over and see him, whether he's throwing his visor, whether, you know, all the antics he did over there? Oh, for sure. And I, I love Coach Spurrier. Like, I really do. He recruited me, and I liked him. Um but I also, it drove us nuts. I mean, they're our rival, the way he was talking to us. And if you also notice the TV copy, I went and found him to shake his hand. But it wasn't, it was just kind of, I always kind of was looking for the quarterback of the other team and looking for the coach of the other team. But he gives me a real quick, like, pat on the back and like, get, <laughs> get out of here. Like, I don't want to see your face anymore that I already had to. And the other thing was afterwards, Danny Warfel and I were pretty close because we developed a relationship uh, in high school, when we were being recruited by a lot of the teams, we would kind of trade information and find out what schools were telling each other what. So I had talked to him, and we actually talked after the game in the parking lot and kind of just had a moment. And he was so gracious. I mean, he's one of the nicest, you know, classiest guys you could have. He's like, man, he's like, how many yards did you throw for 400 yards in the fourth quarter alone? Like, he was joking about, you know, what an incredible game it was from his side and couldn't have been more gracious in defeat. But yeah, it was. It was unbelievable, and thank goodness we did get the French quarter, the fifth quarter and the French quarter, because that did really put an emphasis on it. The reason I went back and said, like, I would have gone for two is, like, the standard at Florida State was championship, and I knew, like, with the tie, we wouldn't have a chance at the national championship, so that's the only thing that I looked back on and said, oh, well, right. man, like, that's the one thing that's unobtainable now, but thankfully we got the best of them, because that almost is, is just as sweet. <laughs> and for the people that don't know, I think you threw for 421 in that game. Yeah. You were 18 of 22 in the fourth quarter for 230-something yards. But I want to go on. You went and found him in the parking lot? Is that something no, you would do? Like you kind of – where they came out, where I was – because I would come out and I would kind of sneak out a back door just so I didn't have to, like, deal with a lot of the, you know, autograph stuff. My family kind of knew where to meet me, and it was closer to where the visitors came out at the time. And so I kind of saw him as he was going on to his, you know, the buses they were getting ready to leave oh, okay. the Gainesville. And so we just had a quick minute. Uh, I, but again, like, couldn't have been more gracious. Well, that's good stuff, Danny. We really appreciate you taking some time out. Hope you and your family are safe. And again, that's one to three on Mad Dog Radio. You can listen to you. And that's, uh, it's at 82 on Sirius XM, yep. right? Yep, channel right. 82 with Steve Torrey. Yeah. So a guy's talking draft. That's coming up soon, right? It is. It is. It's right around the corner and we're going forward. It's going to be interesting to see Roger Goodell from his living room calling out names. But again, like I said, we're all in this together. It's a new normal. We're a new dynamic. And uh, I guess we're going to have to start getting used to it. But uh, everyone keep keep staying, keep your distance and also keep praying that we have college football in the fall. I'm going to hold Please. out optimism Please. that we have football in the fall. I'm holding on to that with everything I got. If I'm not, sure we're going to relive the whole 95 season with you. Every Perfect. day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Hey, 
Take care, Danny. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Danny. All right, guys. Great chatting. See ya. Our thanks to Danny Cannell. That was great. very gracious of him to give his time to come talk to us and share some great stories uh, about this. But we want to put a little bow on it because, you know, there was the there was the prelim, there was the game, but then there's kind of the stories and then the aftermath of the game too, Corey. And I want to start with, at least for me, a couple of things during the game that were just interesting. We all have those stories. All of us who sat in that stadium or left the stadium it's always a good story. And I had, first of all, I had a really good friend of mine who just couldn't take it. He hated the Gators more than anybody I knew. Right. It was absolutely tearing him up to see this happen in front of him. And he just, he right, you know, I think it was right when that drive was starting and late in the third quarter, he'd had enough. And he left. And we're all giving him a hard time. And he leaves. And we're like, support the team and all that. And I think one of the things that was driving him nuts, and you, all these, any fan who's an FSU fan and has season tickets can testify to this. There's always – you get mad. There's somebody who sells their tickets to a rival fan. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. We had two guys, three rows in front of us, and this was on the, in uh, the following of the Free Shoes You, the comment by uh, by Steve Spurrier. So these two guys, right about the second quarter when they went up by a couple touchdowns, they would take off their shoes and just start chanting, Free Shoes You, and like putting them like in our faces for oh, boy. an hour, hour and right, a half. Right. And we're just – it's it's tearing us up, but we're, you know, we're giving them some slack back. So we're trying to have some fun with it, not get too pissed off. Although my friend was so annoyed, he just couldn't take it anymore and left. So it was awesome by, I'd say by the time the second touchdown went through, you could see these guys getting lower and lower in their seats. Yeah. And by, by, uh, by the time Danny ran that one in, I mean, you, you couldn't find them under, they were hiding under the bleachers because they were sure. getting so much crap from everybody around them. And the worst, the best part of, for us and for them is they had to stay to the very end. They couldn't leave. So basically they had about 100 FSU fans following these two guys all the way out of the stadium, just giving them a hard time. So, I mean, that that was – and I've got a couple other stories for after the game, but I'm sure you've got some too, Corey. Yeah, I don't, yeah. we didn't have any Florida fans sitting next to us. What I remember there, – there's a lot of memories from that. I remember my dad leaving to say he was going to go end his life. This was like <laughs> – this was right when it was 31-3, to 3, right after they had just scored. He's and he was actually going to the bathroom, but he's like, I'm I can't take it anymore. I'm going to end my life. That's and then awful. Five, five minutes later, he comes back and I'm like, Hey, what are you doing here? I thought he's like, I took some cyanide. It takes a while to kick in. I remember that conversation specifically. Like we were, it was gallows humor at that point. Like we, it was over. We were like I said, we were just wanting to see Busby play, so we were joking about it at this point. And then after they scored the first touchdown to make it 31 to 10, they get Florida has a third and one. And I remember specifically, I think Florida called a timeout for some reason, and they went to commercial break. So it was one of those three-minute timeouts. <clears throat> well, Florida State, the entire three minutes, because they went over to Mickey for a second, maybe a half a minute, a minute, and then they came back out on the field and were waiting for the commercial to stop, you know, waiting for TV to come back so they could start the game. Well, for literally the next two minutes, Florida State had 12 guys on the field. For 12 guys, we were we were counting them up, and I'm like, Dad, they got 12 guys on the field. He's like, Yeah, they do. I'm sure they won't notice it. Um, and literally, like the, our whole sections realized it, and there we're screaming. And now we're seven, we're in row 70, so <laughs> nobody's hearing us. But we're all saying, You got 12 guys, and we're on the other side. We're not even under the coach's box. You've got 12. You got 12. You got 12. Everybody's yelling it. There's 12 guys on the field. And finally, right when Florida breaks the huddle. Somebody realizes it and somebody scrambles off. And then I think I think Zach Crockett scored the touchdown. I think Henry Crockett makes the tackle yeah. on that third and one play to get the ball right back. So imagine if they hadn't noticed they had 12 guys on the field and Florida gets an automatic first oh, down. Man. You're running at least three more plays. You're running another minute and a half off the clock. You might just go down and end the game. But they they I just remember so vividly everybody in our section yelling about 12 men on the field. And finally, right before the play, a guy scrambled off and they end up getting the stop. And then from then, obviously they scored 21 points right after that. That's good. Cause I never, I guess going back and looking at that, I guess you wouldn't cause their TV was at a time. It was TV. Now. Yeah. So you wouldn't have seen it, but I'm telling you the whole time during the TV timeout, they had 12 dudes on the field and oh. nobody noticed it. You would have yeah. thought one of the players would have been like, man, it seems like there's one extra guy out here, but no, nobody noticed it until right before, uh, right as Florida was going to the, um, ball. 
One last thing on the game that was, in, and we talked about it with Danny a little bit that was uh, interesting is, you know, the old decision to go for two or not for two. And because there, there was, there was a minute 45 left, Florida had a couple timeouts left. So yeah. typical spur, you think he's going for it, right? Go back and look at that series. You know what he does? He runs the ball. He doesn't call timeouts. Spurrier knew that he wasn't going to win the game. Yeah. He knew, and he knew the worst thing he could do is do what he probably would have happened if he would have passed it, gone three and out. They have enough time to go back and they score and they lose the game. So he just, he, all people gave Bobby crap about not going for two. There wasn't plenty of time. If Spurrier plays his normal mode, there's plenty of time for his team to win or Florida State's team to win. But he went, he just basically accepted the tie and still almost lost because, you know, Danny yeah. was one yard short of stopping that clock and having a chance to win that game. So, I mean, I want, I want to throw that out there, too, because I don't think a lot of people realize that Spurrier completely went in the shell in that last series, which is very much against his personality. The last story I have that one of my favorites being, a, I guess, before I was media, I was a fan back at the time, was coming back. So we're, all, we're glorious, chanting back. And I, I don't know if you remember, they, I, I noticed when I saw the replay, they flashed this stat up during the, uh, it was early in the game, that Spurrier was 1-4 and four against the Bowdens. Yeah. And yeah. that was because they had just lost to Terry Bowden in Gainesville a month earlier. And uh, so this would have been one, four, and one after this. Yeah, I think he had lost. To, I think they lost to them uh, the year before that, too. Did they? I think up at Auburn, yeah. but it wasn't it televised because Auburn was on probation. So it wasn't televised, but I think Florida lost up there, too. Okay. So, yeah, they didn't do that. So we get back. The good thing is my buddy who fled goes, buddy had an apartment. A friend of ours had an apartment right next to basically near Burt Reynolds over there. So a lot of people were parking over there. So we got to go up, and he was second floor, had a deck, had a keg out there. So we're just doing beer funnels, having a great old time. We started the chant, you can't, every time a Florida fan would come by, we chant, you can't beat a Bowden. Right. And I'll never forget this one dude who's got the, I mean, he's got orange and blue from head to his shoes were gator. Everything was gator coming up. And we're chanting that. And this guy comes running, like, below us in the parking lot, screaming up at every F-bomb you could think of, everything else. Kept screaming, why are you so effing happy? It was only a tie. And I remember my best friend replies back, well, if that's the case, why are you so mad? <laughs> and this guy just screamed. He had like a, he had something in his hand. I don't know. It was a something. He threw it down and broke it and just ran away. Oh, it was, good. It was running, yeah. we're chanting still, you still can't beat about it. <clears throat> yeah, that, sure. that was, that was a fun story. Yeah. And that was, uh. You know, the narrative back then, man, as crazy as it was, so Spurrier got there in 90. He got housed by Bowden in 90 in Tallahassee. He did beat him in 91, but that was a heartbroken team that had yeah. just lost to Miami on a wide right, and they still almost beat him with half, literally half their offensive line not playing. Um, they still almost beat him in 91. 92, they, they beat him pretty good again. Mm -hmm. 93, they beat him uh, at the Swamp. Uh, can they they controlled that game, but it got close late. Yeah, that was scary. We, we may put that on our list, Corey. That yeah, that definitely needs to be one. And then this game. So Florida fans had to be like, what? What we? So this guy's good, and they knew Spurrier was really good, but he cannot beat this guy. He cannot beat this team. Is that where we're at now? Even with a thirty-one to three lead, and that was the narrative that never really changed. Honestly, I mean, the the only the only real issue for Florida. I mean, I know the ninety-five game. I, I just think Florida was better in ninety-five. Yeah, um, but '96, like we talked about, Florida State got unlucky to having to, having to play them again. But really, '95 and '97 were the only real times Spurrier beat Bowden in the regular season when it was mano a mano, like strength versus strength, uh, full team versus full team. It was '95 and '97, and even '97, I thought Florida State gave that one. That's the one I think. I know the Super, the Sugar Bowl, the national championship game, probably hurts the most. But that was just a that was just a fluke that you had to play him again. You shouldn't yeah. have had to play him again. It was ridiculous. But the '97 game is the one that kept Florida State from winning a national title. That's the one that Spurrier got over Bowden. All the other ones was Bowden do, in my opinion anyway, it was Bowden doing it to Spurrier. And even the '95 one, when Spurrier finally wins um, after after tying this game and then losing in the Sugar Bowl a month later, they go and get embarrassed by Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So. He was kind of the little – he was the stepbrother. He was the little brother. Florida was the little brother to Florida State for that entire decade. And that's like being – that's that sounds like an insult. I guess it was. But it's like being the little Bosa. Like Florida was still great. Yeah. You know, the, the whoever the – I don't know. I get their names confused. Nick and Joey. I don't know which one's older. They're both awesome. They're both really good. One's a little bit better than the other one. One's a little brother. Florida State was a, – was, you know, they, they dominated that, that decade. They were eight, three, and one. 
And it's that, funny you said the little brother comment because you got to remember that the people that are maybe not, not a little bit older uh, aren't as old as us. And even I don't know how much I'm sure your dad really remembers this. Florida Florida State was really until kind of that run. Now, they, they'd had a few wins over Florida here and there. But really, honestly, until about 87, they were the redheaded stepchild. They were the little brother. They were the one who could. Florida yeah. was always the university, you know just the arrogance that went from there. They were the bigger. They had a, a lot more success in Florida State, at least consistently over that long period. So like you said, for them to have, because they had a couple down years in the late 80s, but now they've got their coach, they're beating everybody, yeah. and they still at that point can beat. So I think that's why had the example like I gave, some of their fans were getting so frustrated. They go, this sure. is the best team we've had and maybe ever. Yeah. And we still, we get, we spot them. They spot us 28 points and we still can't beat them. Yeah, and so when you go from 87 to 2000, they played uh, 16 times over the course of that because of the two bowl games. So out of 16 games, Florida won four of them. Yeah. That 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 puts it into perspective of where that – now, they, they did win one for a national championship. You can't take that away. But still, f- through a 16-game stretch, they won four games. Florida was beating everybody in the SEC by 30 points. But Florida State was the – was you know, stuck in their crawl. It was – they, they – they in that game in particular would have been like it's just never going to happen. Yeah, and that's... you know it really honestly shouldn't have happened if Nebraska could have taken care of Texas in the if they would have just had not a Big Twelve championship game if they just that was the first year and John uh, it's not John Malkovich I can't remember the the Texas coach's name. Um, yeah, uh, what was his name? Anyway, so Texas up, upsets Nebraska in that Big 12 championship game. That's the only reason Florida and Florida State even had to play again. Right. right. And then even then, uh, Jake Plummer, uh, if he could have been, beaten Ohio State in the Fiesta Bowl, then Florida could not have won the national championship. And they probably wouldn't have played as hard. But anyway, a lot of things had to break right for Florida to get to play Florida State and beat them again. Um, man, I wish I could remember that guy's name. But in this instance, mid-90s, they were – they were uh, – just completely I, crushed. Like, what 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 does it take, Steve Spurrier? You're arrogant. You're smug. You've got a great program. Why can't you beat the nice guy on the other sideline? Yeah. And I think that game just really kind of crystallized, like you said when you talked about the fan coming up and screaming at you, crystallized their frustration. Like, yeah. even 31-3. to three. Oh, to go back to these great times. Maybe someday, Corey, we'll be back there again. Uh, not in the near future. So anyway, we're, we're going to finally put a wrap in this game. I think we're now, or let's see, we're probably an hour and 15 minutes yeah. uh, discussing, dissecting this game. And we could still probably go on for a long time because it's so hey, much. By the way, I know earlier on the, in the uh, in this video, I said Javon Curse, I think, for who was on that Florida team. I meant Kevin Carter. Um, Kevin Carter, local yeah. Tallahassee kid. Kevin He's pretty Carter, good, too. He was great. He was, that, <laughs> that whole Florida defense was really good. Uh, but, yeah, I meant Kevin Carter, not Javon Curse. Yeah, well, glad you were able to correct that. Now, you can listen, whether you're watching this online, a video, or you can I mean, this will be part of the podcast. So we'll keep doing this about once a week and set out your suggestions. Be able to do another poll, but feel free whenever we post this as a story to give your suggestions. So there's a lot of them because I, I told my wife, and she goes, well, how many of these can you do? I go, there's been a lot of great FSU games. You could literally, I mean, you could do one a week for a year and still not run out of great, great, great games. Yeah, it's 52 games. You could do that easily. And not only that, I think it's something that we could do even when this is over. Even when we're back to normal, yeah. I think this is something people, until we start creating, until this program starts creating its own memorable wins again, <laughs> let's keep doing this and going back down memory lane because there's a lot of really good memories. Um, a lot, And that's what we're doing, the Seminole Madness thing on War Chant. It's reminding people how many great players there were in this program. But then especially these games, um, you know, 20, 25 years later, they just they take on even more of a special meaning now in hindsight, I think. And that I'll always the 94 Doke at Doke, the choke at Doke, choke in Doke, um, man, just an all time great memory for, for me and my dad. Just I know it was a loss. I mean, a tie. But no, man, it was a win. They yeah. had a 28 point comeback in the fourth quarter against the top five team. And I was there to see it. And, and everybody, you know, everybody leaving Preston, that stadium, everybody leaving that stadium that didn't leave early, it felt like a win. And every Florida fan, it felt like a loss. Absolutely. And to me, it was the pinnacle of FSU getting up on Florida. Like you mentioned, all the the backdrop of why this was so frustrating for Florida Florida fans and so happy for Florida State fans. And then to pile on top of that was the fifth quarter and the French quarter, be able to beat them again. Yeah. So you had a feeling like you beat your biggest rival twice. And one yep. of the best teams they've ever had, the most obnoxious coach in college football, and you beat them twice. 
in the same year for all intents and purposes. So. And I would say that's kind of why I definitely want to do at some point in the future the 98 Florida game yeah. because it flipped a little bit. Florida had beaten Florida State in 96 to win the national championship. The next year they beat yeah. – they came Upset. back and beat Florida State in, uh, in the swamp what they call the greatest game ever played there to keep Florida state from winning a national championship. And then 98 comes and then you're down at the halftime and you, you're playing essentially a third string. You're playing your third string quarterback. That's why that game to me, it ends up, you get to go to the national championship game because the things break, but the, 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 it's, it's pretty neat how the narrative shifted a couple of times yeah. in, a, in a pretty uh, finite window in that 98 game. I tell you, that's about as loud as game as I can ever remember from start to finish in that building. But I was also saying when Rock Preston scores that touchdown in this game in 94, if you watch the replay, the camera shakes. It was oh, yeah, incredibly yeah. loud. And it was incredibly loud from like 10 minutes on. From 10 minutes to the zero, that's, that might be the loudest sustained 10 minutes in Dope Campbell Stadium history because people were starting to believe in it. And then it started happening. And the, the louder the crowd got, the better the team played, and it just fed off each other until we saw history. So that was uh, that was really cool. It's a really cool trip right. down memory lane, Gene. That's Corey's nomination for the next one. I mean, if you're going to do that, we can't do keep doing Florida games. I would give my nomination. I don't know if you were at that one, the, the 89 Miami game. Yeah, but Miami no, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying that should be our next one, but I do think we should do yeah. the 98 Florida at some right, point. Got, yeah, the 89 Miami, Miami game. games in there, too. But, yeah, oh, to, me, yeah. to, me, cause to me, that was the loudest game from beginning to end, yeah. I've never been to a dope. And that was the old, I mean, you had the small little wooden bleachers. It was all that. Yep. I mean, that place the entire time was electric. So anyway, yeah, we go on and on talking about yeah. this. Let's save it for the actual things again. We're probably yeah. on an hour and a half now. Cut it short. Thank you, Corey S. Clark. Keep up your great work on War Chant. Good night, folks. Take care. We'll see you soon.